those of us who are doers sometimes get frustrated with all the, the talking that happens, you know, the, all the planning, all the talking, all the planning, all the talking, and, and it seems like the doing always comes last. So, so this, this is what Ed's going to go after. So he is a member of the staff at the Center for Regional Development at Purdue University. I happen to be a Purdue grad also, so I was really, really happy to, <laughs> to find that he was with Purdue as well. So he's been there for uh, five or six years, and he's been developing a new network-based model for economic and workforce development. These approaches emphasize the strategic value of focused regional collaborations and open innovation in today's global economy. As part of this work, he's developed new disciplines in regional strategy called strategic doing. He currently teaches these new methods and tools in the, uh, at, at Purdue and around the world. He, uh, he actually is going to Alaska right after this, and uh, I, I think it's a little colder there than it is here. <laughs> so prior to starting his economic development work, uh, he worked for uh, corporate strategy and consulting. He's served on consulting teams for, for some of the largest companies in the world. Um, and he started his professional career up in Washington, D.C., where he served as legislative assistant to an Ohio congressman, a staff attorney in the Federal Trade Commission, and staff counsel in the U.S. Senate. So he's got quite an interesting background. I leave you with Ed Morrison. Thank you. Uh, one of the things I hope you accomplish at this conference, which I've been able to do, and I would like you to set this out as a task for yourself, is to meet somebody new, have a conversation with someone new. And the point of that is that we're in a new world of networks, and we can take a step toward building these networks by simply closing triangles meeting someone new, and then introducing that person to someone in your network. So you know Jane, and you've just met Bill, but Jane and Bill don't know each other. So not only do you meet Bill in an event, you introduce them to someone in your network. By doing that small step, repeatedly, we start to build out our networks. I do each, each uh, week probably five to six email introductions of introducing people back and forth. And it's a very simple step. It's um, Bill, please meet Jane. Jane, please meet Bill. A little introduction on Bill. Jane, Bill is a friend of mine. He's got a very interesting career in design. Uh, Jane, uh, uh, Bill, Jane is, a, uh, is an excellent engineer and knows something about strategy. The two of you could meet and talk a little bit. And so you're doing that kind of introduction. This is a really critical step to building networks. So if you do a little bit of math, you can start to understand how that is. I do five email introductions a week. I'm doing 250 a year. Multiply that times 10 people in our office. If we did that, 2,500 email introductions a year. So small steps taken by a network actually result in a large development, large challenge, large opportunity to develop a network. Today, what I want to do is go through strategic doing and give you some introduction to this. So um, we're going to do a signal, and we're going to flip the chain, hopefully flip the slide. Stand, there we go, flip, almost. Maybe not. There we go. I want to talk about three, three situations. One is Oklahoma City. I want to ask you, and I will answer this during the course of the presentation, what are the lessons of Oklahoma City? Oklahoma City, in many ways, has become a, a significant model of how communities and regions can transform, number one. OK, next. What are the lessons of Charleston? Charleston, as you can see, is the 75th largest metro, 75th largest metro and it ranks as one of the top 10 fastest growing cities in software and the internet. And it does not have a major research university. Charleston has the College of Charleston and the medical school. It does not have a, a major research university. So third, let's go to the next one. What are the lessons of Milwaukee? Milwaukee has emerged not just as a water hub 
freshwater technology hub for the Great Lakes. It is now a global water hub. And the dynamo behind it is Rich Mewson, who's the CEO of Badger Meter. He's, he's one of the hundred or so people, uh, companies involved in the water cluster. So what are the lessons of Milwaukee? Why are people calling us at Purdue? This is a map of where I've been in the last four or five years. Up until uh, about two months ago, we didn't have a website for strategic doing. People heard about us, called us up, and asked us to do things like this. Present what it is we're doing and why it could have an impact on your region and what you could do. So as you can see, we're not only in the past year, not only working all around the United States, we're starting to work with universities in Australia, Germany, and the UK. So, but why are people calling us? Okay, next slide. The reason people are calling us, I think, is that we've cracked the code on collaboration. We've figured out how to do collaboration at scale. How do we do this at scale? This is the big challenge. If we're trying to transform our region, we need to do collaboration at scale. It's not enough just for Sarah and I to be able to collaborate or Randy and I to be able to work together. We've got to do this hundreds of people at a time. And I think we've cracked the code on this and we'll share some of the lessons here. But my story starts here in Oklahoma City. This is where I started thinking about this whole challenge of how do you transform a regional economy. This was the most uh, prominent building in downtown Oklahoma City in the mid-1990s, Santa Fe Park and Garage. They were so proud of it, they put their Chamber of Commerce in the first floor. Now, the idea of putting a first uh, Chamber of Commerce in a parking garage, apparently never thought that they would really think about the, the impact of that, but for many years, the Chamber of Commerce was in the first floor of this parking garage. And my, ver my journey on strategic doing really started here in the first floor. So, so it all comes down to this. These are the lessons that we need to really absorb. It's about thinking differently, behaving differently, and doing differently. So collaboration is a complex set of skills. These are a complex set of skills that we can actually teach people, but it's not so simple as oftentimes we think of it. It's not just a mere exchange of business cards or getting to know somebody. Uh, it's the capacity to think differently, to behave differently, and to do differently. And we're going to go through this. So let's just start out with thinking differently. First, we're going to take a, an economics lesson. Our economy, if you hit that once, we have a market economy. Our market economy in, consists of investments, activities, organizations that are publicly valuable and privately profitable. That's what we think of as our market economy. Surrounding our market economy, we have a civic economy. And our civic economy is publicly valuable, but not necessarily privately profitable. So our civic economy includes government, includes universities, includes foundations, includes a lot of our nonprofits. And it's this working together of our civic and our market economy that is the genius of our, of our, of our economy. These two things are supposed to work together. And that's why democratic societies grow faster than non-democratic societies. Because by definition, the democratic societies have a civic economy that is more flexible, more malleable, not so top-down. So in our regions, we have to build collaborations across our market and our civic economies. We have to get away from the highly polarized and in my view, erroneous debate about public sector and private sector. Misstates the issue, misstates the idea. We don't grow by choking government. And at the same time, government doesn't have all the answers. So, true, we have a civic economy and a market economy and we've got to build both of these together. 
And how do we build them together? We think about how do we manage and how do we build three flows of money in a region. Good money flows into our region when businesses trade outside. That's what Bruce Katz was talking about with exports. Neutral money circulates in our region when we buy and sell from one another, when we develop the supply chains that support our companies, when we buy and sell each from each other in our retail, and bad money leaks out of our system when we don't do that and when people move out, when people leave. So our job collectively, no matter where you sit, in the market economy or the civic economy, if you care about prosperity, you're trying to find ways to increase the flow of good money, increase the velocity of neutral money, and reduce the flow of bad money. That's it. This is what we've got to do. So the challenge, however, is that our economy, our underlying economy, is going through a big shift, and has been for the last 30 years or so. And that shift is this that the first curve you see, the green curve, depicts the curve that happened with the Industrial Revolution, that we built these large industrial corporations, enormously successful corporations. Randy knows AT&T. But we've got a whole range of other corporations. These were all big industrial corporations, and they started to peak in terms of their size in the late 60s and early 70s. The early canary in the cage, the steel industry. I'm from Cleveland, I watched this happen. The steel industry started peaking in the 70s and hit the wall in the late 70s. At the same time, what's happening as well is our grandchildren's economy is emerging. And everybody who's seen a six-year-old pick up an iPhone and start thumb typing understands what our grandchildren's economy is. Our grandchildren's economy is built around networks. So the way in which wealth is being created in our, in our economy globally is shifting from large hierarchical organizations to networks. We saw today about how big companies are starting to pull apart. All right, Jim talked to us a little bit about that. Well, that's because they're moving toward more network-based organizational structures. So our challenge is this that we, most of us, grew up in the hierarchical environment. And we have in our head a hierarchical structure. And we have to move toward a more networked mindset. And this is a challenge. This is a big, big challenge. And it's a challenge of cognitive reframing, reframing how we think. So our challenge is this. We've got to connect the assets on our first curve, on our grandparents' economy, to the opportunities on our grandchildren's economy. And it goes like that. Essentially, there's a network opportunity for us to migrate our assets to our grandchildren's opportunities. That's the big opportunity we have. And that means connecting our colleges and universities to our high schools. It means connecting our high schools to our libraries. It means connecting our libraries to our cultural institutions. It means developing hundreds and hundreds of new connections in our community and region. Because the regions that figure this out, those are the ones that are going to prosper. Those are the ones going to prosper. So rule number one, however, is stop thinking like our pets. Which means this, that most of us have in our mind the notion that there are invisible fences that we should not cross, whether those are organizational or political boundaries, and that we habitually don't cross those. Well, that's about as sensible as standing in the middle of a yard with an electric with a, an invisible fence. It's silly. We need to be crossing these boundaries. We need to be moving aggressively across these boundaries and not holding ourselves back with our mind. So it's very important to adopt a more network horizontal view of the world. Now this, however, does require us to start thinking about behaving differently, behaving differently. Because the implication of hierarchy 
is that the behavior expected of hierarchy that we grew up with is what? It's vertically oriented. That behavior is ver so as long as I pay attention to my boss and my subordinates, I'm doing okay. As long as I pay attention to my boundaries, I'm doing okay. So even think about how we talk about collaboration in the civic economy, in the civic space, and we talk about stakeholders. Stakeholders. What does that convey? It conveys the idea that someone has a stake and a boundary, and that if we cross into that boundary, we need to involve them, engage them, help them become part of our process. Because somehow, if we don't, our process is illegitimate. So we need to involve all the stakeholders. That's the premise of a lot of our thinking. What if, on the other hand, we started thinking about our civic economy and the collaborations as shareholders? Not stakeholders, but civic shareholders. People willing to invest their time, their energy, their resources, their expertise, their networks, their passions. Now you get a different view. Now you start to see the world a little bit differently. Because in, in a stakeholder world, the whole premise of the stakeholder world is if you don't have all the stakeholders at the table, you're, you're somehow being illegitimate. Your process is faulted, is corrupted. Well, that slowed us down enormously. That whole thinking has slowed us down. Because what that really does when you start to think about it is that when you have a stakeholder who is, what, sitting in on that first curve, not wanting to move, wanting to protect his boundary, and most often it's a him, wanting to protect his boundaries, and he's a stakeholder, you've just empowered that person to slow the whole process down. If you start out with the premise that all the stakeholders need to be at the table. So part of this is it's actually a very subtle change in the way in which we think and the way in which we present our challenge. Our challenge is creating new networks and what we want are investors in those new networks. We want civic investors in those new networks. And so if you think about Jim's uh, innovation adoption cycle, the product life cycle, the people who don't want to change are out here. They're the laggards. Well, from your perspective, they're out here. <laughs> they're the laggards. Oftentimes, civic entrepreneurs, the people who are trying to transform the system, get into arguments with the laggards. And they waste their time, because what they do is they alienate the people in the middle. And it's the people in the middle of our regions and our economies that make the transformation possible. It's those people that we need to engage and every time we get into arguments between the innovator and the laggard, we're essentially driving away the people in the middle. And we're saying, it's not, because they're making investments of their time. They'll invest in our process if we give them an experience, a really powerful experience. And we started to see a little bit of that, is how do you do engagement in downtown Bradenton, right? Well, you give them powerful experiences people will come. Okay, so let's talk about behaving differently. Have we had enough of this? The people who do strategic doing have had absolutely enough of this. They don't do this. We don't spend any time doing this. Now this is good television, it's good entertainment perhaps, uh, it might make you feel a little better when you yell and scream at somebody, but it does not build a prosperous economy. It will never, never deliver prosperity. So part of the challenge is turning ourselves away from these kind of conversations. So this is part of the discipline of strategic doing, walking away. One of the great truisms of psychology is the only way to stop playing the game is stop playing the game. So stop playing the game. So the next slide delivers another very, very powerful lesson. And this one is from our founders. Now in 1787, May 1787, when the founders came together 
in Philadelphia, we don't have any real record except for John Madison's notes. John Madison took notes uh, because they didn't want to have any contemporaneous record that was published of the, of the debates. But Madison took his notes, and thankfully we have his notes. So what does not Madison tell us about the first days, first two days of, in May 1787, that the founders did? They adopted rules of civility. That was their first step. Now what were these rules? They were things like, when someone is speaking, you should not read a book or a newspaper. In other words, put your cell phone away. Stop looking at your cell phone. It's disrespectful. When the speaker addressed a chair, addressed the chair, which was everybody knew was going to be Washington, no one should walk in front of the speaker and the chair. Why? Disrespectful. Now these folks knew that they were going to have knockdown, drag out fights. They absolutely knew it. Big state versus small state, Virginia plan, all of that stuff was going, all that was on the horizon. But they understood that unless they limited their behavior, they would not do the complex thinking that they needed to do. And this is a very, very important point. Civility is not just nice to have in a democracy. Civility is critical because it enables us to do the complex thinking that we need to do together. When civility breaks down, we don't do any complex thinking, which is one reason why Congress has now, over after 30 years after I've left it, has really reached rock bottom. It's basically not capable of doing anything. Congress is not capable of doing anything meaningful and because civility is broken down. Now, how we restore civility in Congress is somebody else's problem. But my point is civility matters in a region. It matters a lot. And so establishing those rules of civility and behaving toward one another in ways that build trust and mutual respect is an absolutely fundamental aspect of our democracy. We need it. We critically need it. So in community after community, region after region, you will have to find where people come together to have these conversations. Where is a safe space to have these conversations? In rural Louisiana, and some of the parishes I've been in rural Louisiana, it's at what, the county or the parish fairgrounds. It might be the county, um, uh, the uh, county uh, uh, seat, might be, might be, oftentimes isn't. Uh, in rural uh, Washtenaw Parish, we found volunteer fire departments. These were places people were willing to come. So we have to find those places. Colleges and universities are places that people will come. Because implied in a college or a university is that there are rules of civility. The other major, major, major opportunity that we have is using our public libraries differently. Our public libraries are an incredible resource. They are a pl safe place. Why is that? Because there are rules in a public library. So people understand this. Okay. We also have to understand that we build trust not by talking about it. We build trust by actually doing things together. Now that can be very, very small, very trivial. It can be a very small step, but it's critically important that we actually do something together. So part of the challenge that we had in designing strategic doing is how do we get people moving and doing things not six months from now, but next week? How do we do that? How do we engage people and get them doing? Because it's through that doing process that they build the trusted relationships and they also exclude people from their networks who are not trustworthy, which is important. Okay. This doesn't cut it. And we've all seen this. We've all seen this. We've all seen behavior like this, where people say one thing and do another. Not acceptable. And so part of the opportunity we have in building these new networks in our civic economy 
is understanding that it all starts with a high level of personal integrity. Absolutely, personal integrity matters. And so as we think through how do we teach these skills to young people, it does start, and to adults, it does start with your ability to look yourself in the mirror. Can you do that? Can you do that? Building our civic economy and building a prosperous Tampa Bay region is a very, very high calling. It's a very high calling. Not everybody is called to this job, but part of us, or part of the people who are called to it, have to recognize that personal integrity stands at the core. So, so let's talk a little bit about doing differently. We've talked a little bit about the notion that we have to think differently. We can't be thinking in silos. We can't be thinking in terms of boundaries. We have to be thinking in terms of strengthening cores, strengthening our cores, and connecting our cores. Whether those cores are in a smaller community in the region or whether they're Tampa, you know? There are cores all over. There's nodes and cores all over. We have to build these kind of relationships. So thinking differently is required. In order to build the trusted relationships, we have to behave differently. We have to be willing to cross those invisible boundaries. We have to be willing to reach out. We have to be willing to say no. We have to be willing to set rules, just like a librarian would set rules, on how we behave toward one another. We have to encourage transparency and mutual accountability, all of those things. But we also need a discipline. We need a discipline. Because without the discipline, all of this becomes very flaky. It all just sort of goes up in the air. So we need a new strategy discipline. And so strategic doing is this new strategy discipline. Part of the challenge of trying to figure out how to design a new strategy discipline starts with this, which is a recognition that we can no longer forecast the future. We cannot forecast the future. We can run scenarios and those help sensitize us to the future, but the idea that we can predict the future is a fool's game in my view. So the, the future is no longer linear. So that means baked in to what we have to do, if we're trying to prepare for the future, we need to have agility. We need to be able to move. We need to be able to see new opportunities and move more quickly. So this is one implication, is that it's no longer a linear process. A linear process cannot work in an, in an agile environment, which is one of the reasons why strategic planning doesn't work. So our future is not linear. It is also very complex and very ambiguous. When we start talking about the civic economy of the T Tampa Bay region, and you say we've got to map all the assets, good luck. Good luck. It's hugely complex, hugely complex. You will never map all of the assets in the region. And so the idea that you can somehow come up with the final map, not going to work. So we have to recognize that there is no way to unambiguously decide this is the universe. It's not going to happen. So we have to be content with some ambiguity. We have to be understanding that we're going to have to work with each other to learn by doing. We're going to have to be a little more forgiving of one another because, frankly, nobody knows what the future is. Okay, so our challenge, of course, is that we're struggling with all these legacy systems. Whether it's government contracting or university systems or eco economic development systems or education systems or workforce development systems, all of these systems, every one of them was designed 30, 40, 50, 60 years ago. Every one of them. And we have spent the last 30 years 
on the presumption that we can somehow fix the system. How many times have we heard we need to fix education? Well, I'm here to say, look, those systems served us very, very well on that first curve, enormously well. But those systems do not serve us well on our second curve, on our grandchildren's economy. So we have to stop thinking about reform, and we have to start thinking about transformation. What are these new systems going to look like? Now recall that when I said we can't forecast the future, the true answer is we don't know. But we do know that the old system is not going to work. So our challenge is, OK, what do we think the new system is going to look like? So entrepreneurs face this challenge every day, trying to see around the corner. So civic entrepreneurs, the people who are really designing the new civic economy for our regions, have to come back to this question and say, we don't know, we're going to run to daylight. Which is the advice I got when I had a venture funded project. I finished the, the business plan presentation, the venture capital firm said, yes, we'll write you a check. They wrote me a check. I came in for my first presentation about a month later to give them an update. They said, we got your business plan, we understand that. That's not what we're interested in now. We read your business plan. Your job now is to run to daylight. And they were smart enough to say, look, we understand that. That's a, per that's a view of the, what you think is going to be the future. Now go find the future. Go find it. And you're going to go find it by going out and doing things, not by writing another business plan. So how do we make our way in this very, very, very complex world? How many of us have sat there feeling like this little guy with question marks all over the place going, I'm not sure what we're going to do? How many times have we all faced this situation? So the answer is deceptively simple. And that is, when you are facing a highly complex environment, you follow simple rules. Think about this gentleman as he walked across the Niagara Falls. He was facing conditions he'd never faced before. Above the, nobody had faced, no human had faced those conditions. Above Niagara Falls, in the dark, with the lights on, wind blowing, mist coming up, not being able to see, right? What did he do? One foot in front of the other. So part of our challenge is very much like this gentleman. Part of our challenge, I liken it often to kayaking in the ocean. I used to do a lot of ocean kayaking. When you facing changing conditions in the ocean and you're kayaking, you need to pick your head up very frequently to figure out what the heck's going on. You do not do that by sitting on your, on your paddle, taking your paddle out of your water and just sitting there and thinking, what's going to happen? The wave will flip you or the wind will flip you. But to understand the wave action on your boat or the wind or the current or the tides, You've got to be doing things. You've got to be testing things. You've got to be out there doing things. So part of this is understanding what are the simple rules. So in strategic doing, we have boiled down the simple rules for major collaborations across many, many people. S dozens, dozens, dozens of people can do this all at once. We've done 200 people in a room. So the point of this is strategy is simple rules. I recommend this Harvard Business Review article. And it basically says, companies facing very volatile environments follow simple rules. We need to do the same. So here, uh, I've already given you some of those simple rules. One is think differently. Two is set up rules of behavior and behave differently. Set up high expectations for behavior in the civic space. OK. We boiled down strategy to this. Take away all the mumbo jumbo of corporate strategy for a minute, for the last 20 or 30 years. A lot of it applies to corporations, doesn't apply in the civic space. Got a different challenge, got a different set of challenges in the civic space, in the civic environment. By nature, by nature, the civic economy is collaborative. By definition, economic development is collaborative investments designed to improve the economy by raising incomes. It's collaborative. It's inherently collaborative. 
So when we start thinking about this, we got to boil strategy down to its bare essentials. And those bare essentials are this. Strategy tells us two things. Where are we going and how will we get there? Those are the only two things. Now, you pick up most strategy documents from economic development to workforce development to whatever, and they don't tell you those two things. Oftentimes, they tell you what the specific activity they're going to do. That's not what I asked you. I didn't ask you what your activity I said, what's your outcome? What's your outcome, and how will you get there? So we need an outcome, and we need a pathway, and preferably the pathway, in order to keep us agile, needs to be designated with milestones. So the metaphor that often works for people is to think of yourself as you are a guide, and you're taking your community up a mountain. And you're going to start out at about 2 o'clock in the afternoon, and you've promised everybody they'll get to the top of the mountain and back down by time night falls, by 7. Now, you haven't climbed that mountain. Nobody's climbed it in your community. But you know what? You've climbed a lot of mountains. Stuart, you've climbed a lot of mountains. Sarah, you have too. All of us in the room have climbed a lot of mountains because we've been involved in the middle of complex collaborations. We know how, to, how these things work. So we can guide other people up the mountain and back down again. So in strategic doing, we don't talk about facilitation. We talk about guiding, expert guides. And all of you could be expert guides. Now, you have to have these, these pathways. In order to figure these two questions out, what we've done in strategic doing is we've divided these two questions into four. So we have outcomes, we have pathways, we have four questions. What could we do? What should we do? What will we do? And what's our 30-30? The first two questions They provide us the outcome. The second two questions, they provide us the pathway. So let me go through these. The first conversation that needs to happen in a collaboration is what could we do? So the issue is how do we link our assets together? Because when we link our assets together, we start to see new opportunity. And this is a fundamental point of collaboration, is to understand that we have multiple assets. All of us have multiple assets. And the conversations we never have is, what would happen if we started to connect these assets? What new opportunities emerge? And we never have that conversation in a disciplined way. Because it's not about, I've got my assets and Randy's got his assets. It's a question of Randy's assets and my assets. If we connected these two things, what would happen? And if we connected Stewart's to those, what new opportunities do we see? That's the job of leadership, is to start spotting these new opportunities, running to daylight, identifying what these new opportunities are. Now, we've all been in those, now this is divergent thinking to the previous panel. Now, we've been all, all in that session where we put butcher block paper all over the walls, and we've had all this kind of brainstorming stuff. But we have to move, so we can't just leave it there. So we have to pick, and this is what the second question is, what should we do? What should we do? What should we do? And we teach people what's the heuristic or the rule of thumb that most people say, pick the low-hanging fruit. I used to say when I was a consultant to, to my clients in economic development, the first rule of economic development, stop doing stupid things. Stop doing the really stupid things because you'll be more productive. All right, now having three-hour meetings when you could do them in 20 minutes is stupid. So stop doing the stupid things. So, so part of this is Understanding the low-hanging fruit is also an idea that we can put some rigor around. So we ask people to evaluate their opportunities by how big an impact is this going to have? 
because all things being, con all things being equal, we want to work on the things that are going to have a big impact. Nobody is, gets excited about putting two organizations together to sh save one Xerox machine. I mean, that's not, that's not exciting. But putting two organizations together to transform a riverfront, now you're starting to get, okay, yeah, that's a, that's a pretty exciting legacy. We all want to be working on those legacy products, projects. So the big idea. Now, evaluate each one of your ideas by how hard will it be to do? Or how easy will it be to do? Because all things, again, being, con being equal, we want big ideas that are relatively easy to do. So in a group this size, or bigger, in Arizona with their solar cluster, we had about 200 people in the room. And what did we do? We text voted. We came up with what could we do? We identified the three things we should do. And within an hour, we're already working on those. So the point is, we're all doing this, folks. Nobody's got the perfect eyesight for the future. We're all making judgments. As long as we make a judgment and come back to it, we're OK. We've managed our downside risk. We're not sitting there making a decision for all time. We're going to come back and revisit that and make an adjustment if we need to. So the, the idea of agility gets baked into strategic doing. What should we do? Now here's the question. What will we do? What will we do? Now this is where a region like Tampa Bay and even Oklahoma City initially and Rockford, Illinois and Northeast Ohio, these regions struggle with this problem because what, the, what they're used to doing, what the business leaders are used to doing is coming up with great ideas for Stewart to do. All right. And so when you have 60 people telling Stewart what to do, not a whole lot gets done. So the challenge is think back to the network. I try to teach young folks. When a business, when a, when a board member comes and says, I got this great idea, their first reaction should be, I got, you, that's a great idea. That's a fantastic idea. What are you going to do next? What are you going to do? Because before I get involved, I got to see you invest time and money and effort into this. Because if you can't convince yourself that it's worth the investment, why should it be worth my investment? Flips the table around a little bit. And so business leaders have got to recognize that they have a huge set of assets that they can make available. And they oftentimes just sit on their hands and try to direct. What's that? That's the hierarchical model. It's a small group of people at the top of the organization doing the thinking, telling everybody else to do the doing. That doesn't work to transform a region. That won't work. You cannot do that. So the challenge in strategic doing is, what is the one small step that you can take over the next 30 days to do something? Because if we all take one small step, we all collectively take a big step. Out in the Arizona case, they were talking about, well, we can't do anything in our solar cluster because we don't have a permanent executive director. And I said, wait a second, hold on. We've got 80 people in the room. If you all put two to three hours a month into this, you've got the equivalent of one highly paid, sophisticated professional. There's no problem here. The only problem is you want to tell somebody else to do this rather than you commit yourself to it. So we think about what is it that you can do to build your community, not huge amounts of time here, two and three hours. I'm probably involved with 20 different groups now all around the world doing this kind of stuff. My involvement in this group, I make email introductions. I don't have time to do it, but I make high leverage email introductions. Very, very helpful. So what's our 30-30 is our last question, and that is, what did we do the last 30 days? What are we going to do the next 30 days? In other words, it's coming together and doing our strategic thinking, not in some huge long process, but in an hour or two. Doing high octane, high performance strategic thinking in two hours. And your strategic thinking is defined by these four questions. 
what could we do, what should we do, what will we do, what's our 30-30? Because if you're not talking about those four questions, you're not talking about your outcomes and your pathways, you're not talking about your strategy, you're talking about something else, which might be interesting, but it's not strategic. So keep yourself focused on these four questions and you'll be fine. So strategic planning, the way we were all taught, goes like this. Think, 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 maybe do. Maybe do. Strategic doing, on the other hand, goes like this. Think, do, think, do, think, do, think, do. Agile product development, design thinking, it's the same idea. It's applied to strategy now. The good news is that the reason people are calling Purdue is because when we do strategic doing workshops, people have fun. They walk away going, wow, that's, that was cool, that was fun, I enjoyed that. It's not a root canal. Most people think of strategy now as a root canal. Oh, don't man, don't make me do that. We have one funny story, a college called us up and said, we've just done our two year our, our strategic planning exercise and it's taken about a year and a half, two years to do that. And I said, great, you got a strategic plan. He said, yeah, we got our strategic plan. And I said, well, why are you calling us? What do you need? And he said, well, the problem is that everybody can't stand each other. We've just gone through this process and alienated everybody. We've got a plan, nobody wants to even meet. So this is a problem when you do strategic planning these days. Strategic doing, on the other hand, you can meet over lunch. We have up in Fairbanks, Alaska at the Extension Center, they meet at the Extension Center. They do their strategic planning meetings standing up. Quick, okay? So alignments emerge when you do this. Alignments emerge. So as you go through this process, you start seeing the alignments emerging. They don't all emerge all at once. They emerge over time, over time. This is a drawing that was done by our colleagues at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee four months after a strategic doing workshop to build their water cluster. All of the people in the room were in those four segments. As they talked together, linking their assets, they identified four areas of opportunity Go on the web sometime and look at what they're doing at the Water Council up in Milwaukee. It's unbelievable what those folks have done. Do yourself a favor, try to get Rich Mewson down here, head a badger meter. He will burn your socks off. He's so excited. So the swarm starts to form. And this is what happens in communities. It's a swarm of people starting to do new things together, working together. And it's nothing that you ever foresaw, nothing that you could ever imagine. But this is what transforms regions. This is what transforms regions. So 2002, Ernest Andrade came to me and said, I can't afford to pay you. You're working for the chamber. Um, I'm a city employee. Uh, I want to do something more than have Charleston be a Disney set. Uh, it's got to do more than tourism. I think we've got to do something in the digital area, and I've got an idea for the digital corridor. And I said, what is that? And he pulled out a street sign, and he said, this is the digital corridor. He had a logo. That's all he had, a logo. Now. What we did, because Ernest was a good friend and he was, made an earnest appeal, no pun intended, oh, I guess it was pun intended, he made, a, he made an appeal. I met with him every month for breakfast and we drew a map, and this is the map we drew, on single pieces of paper and I said to Ernest, we're gonna build your ecosystem on this map. And the reason, let me walk through the logic of the map. Every community, every community needs brain power. That's the only unique asset we have left. So we have to start there. You have to convert brain power into wealth 
through innovation and entrepreneurship networks. That's why the high-tech corridor is so critical. You have to create wealth, otherwise the brain power leaves. The third thing, we talked about this this morning, you have to have quality connected places. Why? Because both the brain power and the companies are mobile. They won't stick around if you don't have a quality, authentic place. So you need to be building quality, authentic places. You also need to create new narratives. New narratives. So many people in so many regions are driving their regions forward by looking in the rearview mirror. They're looking in the rearview mirror. You go in, you see here. When you go to Lexington, Kentucky, as I did around 2000, one of the things that was so striking about Lexington is they didn't have a narrative. They didn't have a narrative. They were sitting in the middle of Kentucky Bluegrass, which is probably one of the strongest regional brands, except for the Silicon Valley, that I could come up with. And you'd go there and you'd talk to these folks, and what were they talking about? They were talking about the mayor being a jerk, the foundation being a jerk, quack, quack, you know, they were just, it was all static. Go there now, go to Kentucky now, Lexington, Kentucky, and you start to hear the choir. And that's what Tampa Bay needs to focus on. Not, can I sing louder than my next community? But how do we all sing together? How do we create the choir? Because that's where people want to go, and that's where people want to stay. Your young kids will stay there. If you only talk about what happened in the past, I'm a child of Cleveland, as I told you. If you're only talking about the steel mills closing down, I left Cleveland in 1968 and didn't come back for over 45 years. Why is that? I didn't want to put my, I wasn't going to hook my star to some place that was talking about steel mills closing down. So you have to present that future view of where this region is going to go and what this region could be. And you have to create that constantly, continuously, in all sorts of different ways to do that. There's not just one, it's not a branding campaign. It's building the authentic narrative of the place. And then, as part of this whole process, you have to build the collaboration skills. So what I would wish for this regional leadership is that you don't do it once a year, do it twice a year. Do one in the fall, one in the spring. Set six month goals for yourself. Don't do it in, a, in an environment like this where everybody's sitting and there's one person on the stage. On the stage. It's not the sage on the stage anymore. We don't, we don't know what the answer is. We're inviting you to come along in the journey to help discover it. But nobody knows the answer. So there's a bunch of us saying, hey, we're not going to do the old stuff. Let's do some new stuff. It's a lot more fun. And then have work sessions, round tables, people working together on collaborations now. Don't talk about collaborations. Do them. So I would envision, hopefully, that this regional leadership could move around and do this. On, and how much does that cost? Nothing, really. Convening doesn't cost anything, really, when you start thinking about the big picture. It's peanuts. I mean, we were convening consistently in Cleveland with cookies and coffee. And they asked me, how much did this cost? And I said, well, it was a, we com computed it out. We met every week on the college campus asking, what could we do? What should we do? We'd be, start building these collaborations. And they asked, the foundations wanted to know how much this is going to cost because they wanted to invest in it. And I said, well, I don't think there's really that much there for you to invest in. And they said, well, really, how much was it? Well, we totaled it up. It was about 45 cents. If we threw in a fruit plate, it would get over a dollar, though, per person. So this is not a highly expensive. It is a high leverage activity. And it's guided. And it's a powerful experience. And it's a focus on building collaborations, not future, now. So let me take you back, 1993. Uh, I was staring out these windows because they picked me as their consultant. And I really didn't, frankly, know what to do. It was the first time I'd ever 
been in a situation this dire, this difficult. Uh, it was very, very tough. I oftentimes, in 1993, was the only person in the one downtown hotel in Oklahoma City. This is the capital of Oklahoma. Had one downtown hotel, and I was often the only person in it. So it was pretty bad. But we worked together, and the lesson is that we started with six people. Six people. You don't need a huge group to start a buzz. You can start a buzz with six people. If you are determined to follow the lessons of strategic doing, which is not just talk, do. So now, Oklahoma City today looks like this. Now, did we forecast this? Could I envision that walking out, looking out the, no, I had no clue. Now, I claim it all, but. Uh, but uh, no, I had no clue. Our leaders there, one now owns the NBA franchise there. One of them is the president of Oklahoma State University. One still now involved with the medical system. These are all six people basically saying, you know what, we're tired of all the old conversation. We are tired of, of talking about all of the things the poor Oki phenomenon. We're tired of that. We're tired of comparing ourselves to Dallas and feeling like coming up short. We're just tired. We're not going to talk about that anymore. We are going to start looking for opportunity. So we launched a new strategy process in Oklahoma. This is what led to strategic doing. It was a very iterative, agile process. It got us through the Oklahoma City bombing, which was quite a trauma. But people stuck together, people kept on working, people kept on focused, uh, kept focused, and we, we developed an opportunity. What did we do? We built a platform for people to work on, which is what Jim was talking about this morning. We built a platform, a collaborative platform. And we insisted on civility, we insisted on fair dealing, we insisted on transparency, we you couldn't couldn't start running things behind everybody's back. None of that worked. So I'm touched by the idea that we need to redefine leadership. But we need to redefine it by looking backward here. Because John Quincy Adams pretty much captured what leadership in a democracy is. It has nothing to do, as Jim was saying, it has really nothing to do with authority. It has a lot to do with the video we saw this morning. Which means to say that everyone has the potential to be a leader. Everyone. You don't find these leaders in, in the book. You're not going to find them in a book. You're going to find them in convening conversations that are powerful conversations that people want to come to, where they will spend their time and effort, well, they will invest their resources and their riches and their gifts. That's what happens. That's how regions transform. Now, let's see how we're trying to build all this out. So more and more people are coming to this realization. And this is why people are calling Purdue. They're coming to the realization that we're the leaders we've been waiting for. We don't have to ask permission. We can start moving right now. We don't need excuses. We don't need to be focused on the laggards. Our one mistake, if we make it, is that we think we have time. We don't have time. We have to move. We have to do things. Now, the exciting aspect of this is that when you do things, you learn, and you engage, and you build new relationships and you have fun. And the reason the buzz has happened around strategic doing is because people go through the training, or they go through the workshop, or they even, we even have strategic doing the game. And when they play the game, and they have fun, and they realize that thinking and doing and building their community out 
or their region or their neighborhood is a high calling and it's fun to do. So, one of the most inspiring stories that I can share with you, which I did not include in this one, is Flint, Michigan. A small group of six people came to us in Flint with our colleagues from Michigan State. Now, if you don't know Flint, Flint is an absolutely devastated city. Absolutely devastated. Uh, high on crime, high on poverty, collapse of GM, all that stuff. Uh, abandoned houses, copper being stripped out. Six hard-boiled, very intense civic entrepreneurs who want to rebuild Flint came to us and said, we want to break our grant addiction and we think strategic doing will help us. And I said, what do you mean by that? And they said, we have lived for the last 20 or 30 years on a grant addiction, thinking that somebody up there is gonna help save Flint. Whether it's the state government, the federal government, the foundations, we've constantly be lo been looking up there for the answer to Flint. And we don't think it's there anymore. We think it's in the room. We think it's in our neighborhoods, and we've heard strategic doing will enable us to move in that direction. So now our most vibrant community that's doing strategic doing is doing it in the inner city of Flint, Michigan. And it's really, really an inspiring. And what are they dealing with? How do we reduce, what could we do to reduce teenage homicide rates? What could we do to reduce teenage pregnancy? What could we do to deal with the abandonment that we're struggling with? So they're dealing with really, really, really tough issues. And the inspiring thing about it is they realize that when they come together and they start thinking about all of the gifts in their network, all of the assets in their network, they realize the gifts that they have. And they realize that strategic doing enables them to start connecting those assets together and start thinking about new opportunities. So in one strategic doing session, they had a minister, a general contractor, a person from the city, and a couple of young people. And they started right out of that meeting rehabil rehabilitating houses. Just, hey, we can do this. Let's start working on abandoned housing right now. Boom. They got everything donated. They started working on it. And they stopped complaining and they stopped looking for an answer, and they stopped looking for permission, and they started, started working. So this is what's happening. So now let me share with you what we're trying to do in Chicago. Now this is a heavy lift, but it's possible. OECD, which is the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development out of Paris, did a large-scale regional study similar to your project that you had with Battelle, delivered it, it's a region that goes from Milwaukee through Chicago into Gary, northwest Indiana. The question is, can we build a platform, a collaboration platform underneath this region in four key focus areas? That's what we're starting. We started this two months ago. That's what we're starting. Now, just yesterday, Northeast Ohio came to us and said, we like what you're doing in Chicago. Let's do that in Northeast Ohio. They have a HUD-financed sustainability plan, which they've completed, $4 million sustainability plan. The question is, how do we move from plan to platform? How do we move from idea to implementation? How do we move from conflict to collaboration? And the answer is follow simple rules. Start the conversation, keep it focused, keep it guided, driven toward collaborations with serious success metrics in a process that enables you to make changes as you learn. So we've outlined a process and we're gonna be kicking this off in two weeks. So this is what we're doing in, in Northeast Ohio. So it's strategic doing. The real question is thinking differently, thinking differently. 
you've got to start thinking more horizontally and less vertically. It's not about the boundaries, it's about the cores. The boundaries don't matter. They matter to politicians, but they don't matter to us. We need, we're thinking globally, we need to be thinking about how do we connect our cores. You need to, need to be thinking about the link and leverage of your assets. How do you generate more productivity out of what you got? That's critically important. Number two, behaving differently. This is the hardest thing. But Sarah is right. If you get people to think differently, you'll get them to behave differently. But behavior is critically important. If we're going to face the really, really complex challenges we have, we have to behave differently. And we have to turn our back from those folks that are just going to sit there and throw bricks. Got a stone in their pocket and want to throw it. Fine, not in my room. Not where we're having a conversation. This is a voluntary group of people coming together to see what we can do. And we have rules, just like a library. If you don't want to it, go somewhere else. Being able to enforce those rules, because why? People won't invest in a process without them. It's too volatile, it's too unpredictable, it's a waste of their time, and they spend their time doing other stuff. And the last is doing something differently. Remember, strategic doing is answering the two key questions of strategy with four questions. What could we do? What should we do? What will we do? What's our 30-30? What's our process for getting back together again and revising our plan? Strategy in this new world is much like software development. It's version 1.1, 1.2, 1.3, 1.4, 1.5. 1 there is no final plan. There is no final plan. You're constantly revising it. So with that, I want to ask you one more question. Strategic doing, we've just started promoting strategic doing in our workshops. We're willing to and want to, in fact, we just talked with the folks of the Polytechnic to potentially partner with us. We'd love to partner. We don't go anywhere without partners. We'd love to figure out a partnership to teach these skills, to teach them in ways that, and to help implement and move from plan to platform. But this is the real question that I have. Are you ready to move to the next level? Are you ready? That's a question. I don't know. I think you are. That's why I'm here. I think you are. But part of the challenge I see in this region, and I'll be very blunt, part of the challenge, and I see this in Florida generally, and it's kind of my own pet theory, because I've been down here for, I don't know, four or five years now, I guess, coming down here. Everybody in Florida, not everybody, but a lot of people from Florida are from somewhere else, right? They come here, right? And they come here with their own sense of what civic life is. Usually that was born in the past in their old communities. And oftentimes these communities are up in the northern industrial areas where we grew up, where I grew up, that have very rigid hierarchies, you know? There's a reason why Cleveland and Detroit and Akron and all these places are having trouble dealing with the change going on because they have very rigid hierarchies. People come down here, the hierarchies aren't all that rigid, but the thinking is still rigid. I think the thinking is still rigid. I think people don't behave well toward one another. They don't, they don't see that the opportunity is right here. It's right here. It's an amazing set of opportunities. And so part of that is just getting to know each other, and much more informally, of course, but also starting to question, you know, how are you thinking about this? Are you really moving toward your grandchildren's economy? Or are you looking back at what you saw and are you behaving in a way uh, that you kind of grew up with? And I just lay that out as an observation. I think that the distance Tampa Bay has to travel to really transform and become a global leader. Oklahoma City is a global leader now. Charleston is a global leader. 
uh, the Water Council in Milwaukee is a global leader. All of these started with conversations about their strategy, which I was involved with. And it tells me that we can intentionally design these networks and do this work. The distance Tampa Bay has to travel is about, as Bobby Jones used to tell us, say in the Gulf, is about the six inches between your ears. It really is. It's not that far. And so what I would encourage this group to do is start thinking about not just one leadership group, but start doing this much more frequently on a more frequent basis where you're mixing and matching and connecting and doing all sorts of stuff and getting people to do things together. That's what will drill, build the region. Thank you. Has anybody heard Ed Morrison speak before? OK. So I want to challenge you. Um, wow. Uh, we, were, huh? we have um, Stan and I were going to go to Purdue earlier this year to um, get certified in strategic doing. And really because um, we wanted to have a language to come back and share. And I think, you know, we, we didn't, there's a, a blurb, we've written some stuff on strategic doing on, on the website. And it's because when people speak a common language, um, it, it bypasses a lot of things. They, they know what the expectations are, they know what the rules are. Strategic doing is a rule book for how to get things done. You know, and uh, it's been coming to Florida for four or five years. And, and everybody talks about, we need to do this. I don't know, I, we asked um, Peggy, who, who is, uh, is, I don't know exactly what her title, she's like executive administrator and, and helps she's Ed a, keep all these balls in the air. She's the quarter, she's the one that's spinner. spinning all yes. the plates. Right? Um, we asked her for some dates that he's available to do this. And I would hope that we would move from a place of just talking about how we want to do this and make a commitment with your time. It takes three days. We need 10 people to financially commit to pay for the, to pay for the session and to mark out three days on their calendar, 10 people who will learn a language that can work together. And then we need some more of you to come on the first day and learn to play the game so that you can be the next follower. Because I think it'd be really sad if Ed comes back sometime in the next year or the next two years and we go, we need, really need to do something and still be saying we really need to do something. I think one of the challenges is, is that we've all come from different places mm. And we need to take ownership. If you are not scheduled to be here tomorrow, clear your calendar. Um, Mark Sharp is going to be here. And uh, he's, he's one of the commissioners from, um, from, from Hillsborough County. And he talks about taking ownership. I, I grew up in a church where our pastor said, don't come to me with problems unless you want to be part of the solution. And so I think somebody said that to somebody earlier about being a part of the solution. So, I mean, we have all kinds of great things that are going on here. So I challenge you to be a part of the solution. And, and is, did, is, did Randy slip out? So, um, and I think, make sure that you thank the High Tech Corridor. Yeah. I mean, you know, we wanted to say that somebody who's a strategic doer, he's been an incredible support to us, which is really exciting because we're just like two people doing this thing called Spark Growth. You know, and a lot of people have called us tree huggers and all kinds of other things because we don't have some like typical funding like, like somebody else does. Um, and I have to thank Marilyn Howard over here from the uh, Manatee Community Foundation with the Knight Advised Donor Fund. Yes, we're a Knight Ritter uh, uh, town and they've invested here. And um, she helped pay for Ed to come. Don't you think that was a good investment? Thank you. And for the video to capture it. So I challenge you, don't just come and listen. Make a commitment. What is three days? You know, that's a weekend. And, and I want to congratulate you, Manatee County, the city of Bradenton, the Bradenton area, the stuff that Johnette was talking about. Last night at the dessert reception, we said, you have prepared yourself for this. 
I've been getting text messages from people in the audience going, oh my gosh, this man just rocks, he's so awesome. So let's step up to the table and do that. Um, we have, uh, I think we have a, a, a video here that uh, Stan has, and uh, what, I can't tell. Are you ready to move to the next level? <laughs> Are you ready to move to the next level? Mm -hmm. Okay, let's hear it for Ed. And uh, we have dates in June. I want emails from people who are gonna do something, not just talk about it. Great, thank, thank you. you. Thank you.